In the next module in Creating Educational Technologies, we're going to be exploring artificial intelligence. Now, during this module, we're going to be examining the various aspects of artificial intelligence as it relates to education and exploring it as an educational technology, a tool for use in teaching and learning. This week, we're going to examine the concept of artificial intelligence, the fundamental um, theories behind that, how artificial intelligence is being applied to education, and some of the opportunities that are arising from that. And then we're going to narrow in and look at a particular application of artificial intelligence, and that is around chatbots. And the particular tool that you're going to be using in your portfolio assessment in creating a chatbot um, using the tool Bot Libra. So first off, there is a um, document in the course material that explores the, the concept of artificial intelligence and how it can relate to AI in education. So I'd like you to read through that document. It's, it's not incredibly long and there's sort of small snippets within there, but it's about um, 30 or 40 pages. So skim through that, but look at some of the fundamental concepts that are behind artificial intelligence. Now you don't need to understand them in great depth, but you do need to have a general overview of what we mean by artificial intelligence in education. So look at the text Intelligence Unleashed and through your examination of this document, it explains how the general model for the use of artificial intelligence in education is that we have not just one model, but three. Um, over time, we've found that trying to address all of artificial intelligence as it relates to learning and the teaching processes can't really be encompassed in a single model. So the general philosophy currently is that there are three fundamental models that make up educational artificial intelligence applications. The first is a domain model. And this is a model that relates to the content of what is being taught. So often this is in a rule-based model, a whole lot of um, key words that relate to particular topics and explanations about what those terms mean or it may relate to a body of knowledge that's been trained in various artificial intelligence applications to be able to interpret what the content um, is about and provide um, learning context around that content that students can engage with. Now with that, we then have a pedagogy model, which is interacts with the domain model and it engages in various ways of teaching. Um, so it may be presenting information in small chunks and um, quizzing students on their understanding of those that content. Or it may be interpreting um, students' questions and interpreting how best to provide answers to that. Um, and more commonly now, it may be adaptive in that it will adjust the responses based upon the perceived understanding of the learner. And this is where we bring in the third model, which is the learner model. So it's an understanding of the learner. What are their strengths, their weaknesses? What pedagogical approaches um, best work with that learner? Um, how that learner has developed, what level they are in terms of various hierarchical um, instructional processes. But it encompasses a um, a portfolio of the learner that the AI systems, the domain model and the pedagogy model can interact with and customize things to suit the individual needs of the learner. So those three models represent different processes that work interactively to create a interaction with the learner, um, with the AI system that's helping them with their learning. Um, and together this creates what's called an, a learner interface uh, and generally it has interactive content um, 
which is tailored to suit the particular needs of the learner and a process of evolving that um, adaptability, which we call, well, it's defined around data capture, but there's a range of AI systems where we collect data on how the student is learning, how they're interacting with the pedagogy, how they're interacting with the content, what sort of words they're using, which words are generating a correct response, which words are creating incorrect responses. And a lot of AI systems rely upon the capture of data about their learning interactions. And then they refine that process. And the best AI systems refine those automatically. And we call that machine learning, where over time, the AI tutorial or tutor gets better and better because it has been trained on more and more um, students and more and more interactions with different um, students. And it learns over time how to be a better teacher. And that's what really differentiates an AI application and particularly a machine learning uh, supported AI application from a simple programmed instruction um, material. So that data analysis ideally is done by the computer, the AI system itself, but sometimes it can be done by um, humans and we call those rule-based systems. They're much more manually intensive because the, the computer's not doing it all itself. Um, and they tend to be much more limited. And we'll talk about some of those limitations as we go. But the fully automated systems that learn from the interactions, that's where the power of AI and machine learning is revolutionizing a whole range of industries, not just education, um, but it could be um, optimizing processes for flying a plane in terms of autopilots or optimizing processes for selling goods via online stores and which which prompts to provide to customers, which color schemes and all the rest best meet the needs of particular cus um, customers. And where it's successful, where a sale is achieved, those particular properties are reinforced. And where it's unsuccessful, where a sale is not achieved, the particular properties that were tried out are reduced. So it's less likely to try that approach again. And through thousands and thousands of interactions, it refines itself, it learns, and becomes better at selling. Just one example of many, many different applications of artificial intelligence. It could be around garbage collection. It could be around um, being able to translate words correctly and become more efficient in tra um, voice translation. Lots of different processes use these fundamental mechanics. We're interested in and focused more on the educational application. Same mechanics as being used in an autopilot or um, uh, a voice translation system, but we're applying it to a tutoring process, a teaching process of improving the learning of a student interacting with the AI system. And collectively, this becomes what's called the open learner model, which is a set of uh, processes that provide um, instructions and advice to students to support their learning. But it can also help inform teachers. We don't just have to use AI systems on their own. Um, they can be used in conjunction with traditional teaching practices, and they can provide us advice and understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of our students and how we can go about improving their learning interactions. So we shouldn't just think of AI as a replacement for um, other processes, in our case, teaching. Very often it can be used as a way of augmenting uh, the processes. Now, of course, the concern is often that that augmentation will um, eventually migrate to replacement. And that is true. Um, many systems that can be replaced by computers will be. But in the meantime, certainly over the next decade or so, there will be a transition process whereby we will work with AI systems to improve various processes. And in our case, the processes of teaching. So go through the document um, and it will explain some of the nuances of these terms and processes in a little bit more detail. But what we're really interested in is how we can now use these AIs 
for education, how we can apply it. So again, on the website, you'll see a number of other documents um, in terms of how AI is used in education. And have a look at some of those and make a suggestion on how you feel that artificial intelligence is and will be used in education and post that response to Teams. And we'll discuss that further in the tutorials. But have a look at the different um, applications for artificial intelligence. This is a summary. So first off, artificial intelligence can be used for the basic uh, processes we have in education. Um, say role taking, using um, image recognition, we can have a camera set up and that will automatically detect the students that are in our class and determine who's there and who's not. And that will save a lot of time. Um, make role taking, which normally takes about 10 minutes of a lesson, um, much more efficient and effective. But other things can also be applied around that. Um, grading is one that a lot of effort's being put into. Um, we've had systems to automate um, marking for, say, multiple choice questions for a long time. They haven't really required any AI because they were very simple processes. But automatically marking an essay or a scientific experiment or computer program starts becoming more complex and difficult, but not impossible, particularly when we introduce machine learning processes where the AI can become more experienced and better at doing things over time through practice just as humans learn. So systems for automatic grading are, are in place now, and many of them are exceeding what human graders can achieve in terms of the accuracy um, in the marking of student work. Now that's a little bit confronting, because it used to be something that we thought humans would be dominant with. And that's a fundamental experience with artificial intelligence applications. There's always things that we think that that we just done by humans. And over time, we find ways for computers and AI systems to achieve the same processes um, and often exceed them. Now, the key aspect at the moment is around what we call outliers, where there are things that we haven't thought about. Now, inexperienced humans also have that same problem. When things come up that we haven't thought about, we make mistakes and fail in achieving things. We do well with things that we're practiced and trained and taught how to do, but strange things we have difficulty with. And so does AI systems. Um, and machine learning allows the AI to make educated guesses. That's where it's different to rule-based um, AI, where in a rule-based system, we have to have programmed in the responses. And if we haven't programmed in a response, then the AI really doesn't know what to do. But with machine learning processes, and we use words such as neural networks and things like that, which we'll talk a little bit about. The AI can go through a series of probability um, comparisons and make a reasoned, educated um, guess at what a, a good response would be. And over time, as it makes those guesses and it identifies which of those guesses are successful versus which are unsuccessful, its ability to make correct guesses improves just as a human being would do so. So some other applications. Um, we talked a little bit about having adaptive learning tools, and that's a, a really big focus area for AI tutorials, because one of the holy grails of education is to have one-to-one -one tutorials, where you can have a close interaction with a student and guide them through in their learning by really understanding in detail all of their strengths and weaknesses and interests and being able to tailor um, how they learn and what they learn to their specific needs. But of course, in the real world, when you've got 20 or 30 students, that becomes very, very, very difficult, simply because you just don't have enough time to provide that level of attention to each student. AI systems, though, because of the ability for computerized systems to be easily replicated, so if we have an effective um, AI model that can be used for teaching an individual student based upon their strengths and weaknesses and so forth, we can very simply copy that model and have a, um, 20 of these models working 
one for each individual student. So we can get around that, pro that difficulty we've always had in education around individualizing instruction. And that's a really powerful potential for artificial intelligence. Um, it can be used to, in, to point out where we need to improve. And as I said, the diagnostic capabilities of artificial intelligence are built into the processes of its learning and improvement. So we can use that diagnostic processes then to also help inform our students how they can improve. Um, whereas good teachers do that as well. But again, it's the capacity of a teacher to work with a large number of students and to provide that feedback in an effective, continuous way. Um, and while it can be done certainly by a human, it's simply um, time consuming. But an AI system is not so, much, so limited and it can provide detailed feedback to students on where they've gone well, where they've had difficulty, where they need to improve and provide that more in-depth support. Um, and that leads to the next one around just that ongoing support. But that support is not just limited to their instruction. We might have a support system that helps them with their behavior, uh, with their emotional support, with their career planning, um, a whole range of systems. Particularly in tertiary, we're developing a lot of these systems to build their students' resilience uh, to ensure that they don't drop out of courses. And a lot of that doesn't have anything to do with the actual instruction of the course, but it's around them coping with um, completing assessment tasks, managing their time, uh, managing their finances, a whole range of other complexities that can be added to our AI models and support students in a whole wide variety of different um, aspects of their educational experiences. Um, as I said, that can also be very useful in providing students with feedback, um, and that's one of their key strengths. Uh, also in looking at how we find and access information. Now, you all would have found that with, with Google searches. Um, Google searches are not necessarily AI driven, but they are increasingly having aspects of AI built into them to try to improve the quality of the searches and their responses that are returned. But we now access a lot of information through online search engines. But increasingly now, we're also using very much AI applications that relate to voice recognition. Uh, many homes now have smart devices and smart terminals and smart speakers and so forth, where you can ask questions and receive valid uh, responses because the AI system in the voice recognition processes have been able to interpret what you need uh, or what you meant by the question and provide you with what you need in terms of a response. Now, they're not perfect yet, but they are certainly far better than they were five years, 10 years ago, and they will be far better into the future because the systems are learning. And there are millions of people using them, so that's there are millions of interactions occurring every day that are all used to train the model and improve it. Um, likewise, there are now systems around image recognition. Uh, the most common ones we're seeing at the moment being popularized in self-driving vehicles where the image recognitions are set up to a level of quality whereby they can make decisions around how to steer and brake and um, drive automobiles. But they're also being used in facial recognition um, particularly for surveillance. But in education, we're now starting to look at the, the idea of picking up cues on how students are learning based upon their facial features. Now, again, as a teacher, we can see when students are frowning and looking frustrated or looking confused. So AI systems can also do that now. And as they start seeing that body language, they can then adjust the instructional processes that are occurring, the pedagogical model, in terms of how students are presented with information, maybe reducing the complexity of it or increasing the complexity of it, uh, the pacing of the information based upon how the student's experience is occurring. Now, we're not just limited to visual processes in that respect. I also do some work with brainwave analysis, 
looking at how students' uh, thought processes are occurring and how their brain waves are changing during a learning interaction. Um, and that's helping inform form various AI models as well. Um, but there are lots of other processes. Um, another one that's being worked on a fair bit is around galvanic response, which is essentially um, how much we're sweating. But by wearing a simple uh, wristband, we can detect that quite easily, and that can uh, help measure students' stress levels. And so again, we can adjust the content based upon students' um, uh, physical uh, emotional responses to the learning um, experiences that they're in engaged with. Um, other processes are looking at their uh, voice in terms of measuring their stress levels and their interest levels and engagement through voice analysis. Um, so lots of different ways of trying to build a better student model so that it can inform the pedagogical model and the content model to better craft the learning experience for the student. And so you can start to see how all of this combined starts getting a much more detailed understanding of the student and how they learn best and the content that they'll engage with and interact with than a teacher could hope to be able to um, replicate. So a few other things. That then starts changing the role of teachers. If, our, if all that information is now available to us, maybe we can then utilize that information ourselves as teachers to better understand our students and to then cater various activities and interactions um, that supplement what the AI system is doing, but allow us to have that personal interaction, that human uh, touch to the educational experience that many people value highly. Not everyone though. Um, I do a fair bit of work with robotics and AI systems and how robotics can replace that human interaction aspect for some students. Um, and there's been a great amount of success done with autistic students where the human interaction is actually one of the limiting factors in their learning. And the variability and con confusing nature of human interactions can um, disrupt their learning. Whereas an AI enabled robot, which is much more predictable for the student and they are able to relate to it and interact with it much more effectively, um, it's proving to be very useful uh, for their instruction. Likewise, for young children, um, Again, it was one of the areas that some educators thought, oh, AI will never be used to teach uh, young children because they need that human interaction and human engagement. But we're actually finding that they actually had no problems at all. Um, thinking of a robot as a real um, teacher and interacting with it as they would with a human being. And indeed, they can have really great human relationship interactions with a robotic device. Of course, most of their toys are robotic devices um, and their imagination easily allows them to conceive of the robot as, a, as something that they can interact with as though it was real. Um, and for them, it is real. It's providing them with support with their learning. It's looking after their um, interests and emotions. It's responding to them in a positive, um, supportive way. And this idea of human interactions is really being upturned with various robotic devices. Uh, there's robot seals that we're deploying in nursing homes um, where elderly people can interact with this robot seal and it um, comforts them and it, um, engages them, talks with them and they can interact with it. And it's much more patient with them um, when they have difficulty communicating and engaging with human staff. So the idea of the emotional aspect of AI and of robotics um, has certainly been challenged in recent years. So a few other things. Um, AI, as I said, is not just limited to uh, providing educational support, but also around the behavioral and uh, emotional support, particularly around trial and error, because AI systems can be infinitely patient. Um, and a student can keep trying and keep working at something and being supported by the AI far beyond the patience level of most human teachers. 
to do similar things. Um, and then again, as we said before, the data that's being collected by AI can be used to for lots of other purposes, um, certainly to teach, but also to support students um, and also to help them with their career development and a whole range of other aspects. Of course, that level of data does open up potential uh, misuse of that data, and there needs to be checks and balances brought into place around that, particularly when we have AI systems that can influence students uh, at least as or more so than teachers do. We know that teachers strongly influence students in their behavior and their um, beliefs and understanding about a whole range of concepts. And if we can make that process much more effective, that does open up potential problems. Um, so there, there are some, there are a range of ethical issues around AI and we're gonna be talking about those in later weeks. Uh, and finally, AI systems are much more flexible. They can be very portable, so students can learn and engage wherever they have the, a device. And many of these systems can be done through a smartphone um, and things of that nature. So students can be effectively learning and their learning can be monitored and modified and engaged with by an AI system on a bus or on a beach, or wherever they might happen to be. Um, AI systems can be much more deployable. So we can have AI systems developed from experts all over the place. And as with any computer system or computer tutorial system, they're easily replicated and transferred. And so we can have the best AI instructors from around the world available to individual students wherever they are in the world. So lots of different aspects around AI in education and its uh, future potential. So have a look at those readings and Think if you can come up with your own contributions of how AI can support um, teaching and learning. So again, here's a, a narrowing down now as we start thinking about a particular AI application, which is the conversation bots um, or tutorial bots or essentially um, AI applications where we have a conversation with them. Now they can be through text, they can be now through voice, um, and so there's a range of ways of interacting with these, but the four main, or well, four or five main processes are providing an evaluation um, to students in terms of feedback, uh, but also to teachers in terms of feedback on how students are going in various activities and tasks. So again, lots of data is being collected by AI systems. AI systems rely upon data and that data can then be then formatted and presented in ways that is useful for teachers and also for students. So not just used by the AI, but also used by others. Um, students can ask fact-based questions and receive answers. Um, and that's a very common application of um, chatbots. They can be used as a medium for communication. So you can set questions like you would for a quiz and have the chatbot um, present the quiz to students and have them go through and provide answers. Or it could be done as a test or as an instructional activity, guiding them through a process whereby they have to work through a series of stages. Um, so there can be a range of communication processes through chatbots. And then there's just the processes of having a natural conversation. Just as there's a benefit for students talking to their teachers, um, and having that social conversational interaction to practice their own language skills, their own grammar, their own um, questioning ability. Um, so too that they can do that with um, more advanced AI chatbot systems where they can pose questions in a range of different ways and see the responses, then evaluate the responses and um, refine their questions and carry out uh, an ongoing conversational process. But all up, this is part generally of a tutorial system, which is designed to help students learn various concepts and processes um, and have a, um, we call didactic or conversational support to those processes. Just as a teacher would provide that um, conversational support to students in various learning instances, as I am doing now. But you can imagine that I could be replaced quite easily here with a chatbot 
Um, that could have been either pre-programmed or trained by a machine learning process. And over time, it's improved itself based upon your responses to various assessment tasks and quizzes and things like that. Um, and with our ability for to generate um, avatars now, um, my talking head could very easily be a computer generated talking head. And you would have difficulty in discerning the differences between myself as a human instructor and an AI instructor. So these are the areas where education is progressing very rapidly. It's not just education, of course, every industry is facing um, disruption, as we call it, through um, the advent of artificial intelligence and the effectiveness it's proving around machine learning. But we are, of course, focused on what's happening in education. So it also opens up a range of opportunities. Now, yes, things will be different. AIs are going to replace many of the more traditional processes that have occurred in education. But as we find with all industries, except the few that really are destroyed and die out, they transform based upon the impact of new technologies. And education will transform and the role of teachers and the processes that occur in education will adjust to take advantage of the new technology, in this case AI, um, and adopt new ways of doing things. So here is a range of problems that are common in education and some of the AI solutions to these problems. So one is the standardized curriculum, teaching everyone in a class the same thing has always been a problem. So it doesn't cater for their individual needs. And personalized learning is a, an AI based solution to that. Likewise, having individualized instruction and one-to-one -one tutor time, of course, of the large number of students generally um, has been difficult, but having personal virtual tutors is a way of addressing that. Same sort of concept of personalized learning. Grading and assessment is often time consuming um, and we tend to rely then upon multiple choice as a, as a uh, time effective way of um, doing assessment. But with AI systems, we can have much more open-ended nuanced questions and the marking and feedback can be provided around those in real time. Um, often in a classroom environment, students may have questions but either are too shy or the teacher doesn't have time to address all the questions that students might wish to ask. But with AI virtual classroom assistants, they can ask the questions of the AI and receive responses that support their learning. Whereby in a normal classroom environment, the questions would often be disruptive to that process. Um, Personalised communication can now be done at scale. So we can have individual, individual answers made to student queries and questions that they might submit by email or might be submitted by parents or other things. So that's a way of addressing these, again, specific needs of, of the learner without having to rely upon generic responses that are suitable for everyone, uh, simply because we don't have time to address specific responses to each individual. Um, AI systems can be used for selection processes. Whereas at the moment we use a lot of our assessment, particularly in um, the senior years in secondary education, is around selecting students for restrictive places at tertiary education, um, giving them a score that allows them to then apply to university to get into uh, particular courses based upon their interests and so forth. AI systems can be used to improve that selection process. Because now we can have AI systems that look at a whole lot of data about students. Um, but it doesn't need to just be done for um, tertiary entrance. We might be wanting to select students um, who is going to be on, a, on the debating team or a sporting team or any process whereby we need to make complex selections. Um, and the advantage of this is that if the AI system doesn't have any bias, and we're going to be talking about bias in later weeks, then it's a much fairer process. It can be made much more transparent in some cases, um, but everyone is then subject to the same um, computerized model 
Uh, so individual human biases can often be uh, reduced. But there are some other biases that can creep in from AI systems, and we'll talk about those in later weeks. Um, we can do also what's called sentiment analysis, which is trying to determine students, um, their mood, essentially, how they're liking a course or disliking a course, or liking their um, degree program. Are they likely to drop out? Are they likely to disengage or not attend school? Um, a whole range of different analysis that can be put into place to better understand students and provide responses and feedback and supportive mechanisms to reduce the possible negative consequences of their, um, of their sentiment. And finally, another area, particularly in tertiary, is using AI to address um, systemic cheating, particularly with um, online cheating and plagiarism that's becoming supported by various educational technologies um, that are negative to some people's perceptions in education. We can also use AI systems to try to combat that, whereby we can identify patterns and uh, repeated use of particular assessment items or assessment responses and a whole range of other processes down to looking at how students um, type. There's a whole lot of um, typing analysis that's done for online testing. So over a course, there'll be various instances where students have typed responses in and they've developed a particular pattern of how long they spend typing certain keystrokes and a um, whole lot of, it's like a fingerprint based upon how you type. And so once that model has been developed for a student, we can then have them do an online exam and if their model of how they type is significantly different to how they've demonstrated that they type elsewhere in the course, that can flag the possibility that there's someone else doing that exam other than the student. So again, there's lots of different techniques being applied to combat cheating. Uh, the most common is around plagiarism detection, trying to analyze students' work and to see if it matches other students' work. But it can also be used to see if their assignments match previous work of that same student that they've done in class or through the discussion forums or through previously submitted assignments and a whole lot of other processes that build up a better model of what the student is, again, that student model, and then apply it to understanding if, they, if there are any variances or discrepancies in that model that might indicate that something is askew. Okay, so for your portfolio item for this module, you're going to be developing a chatbot. Now, it is going to be what we call a rules-based chatbot. There are a range of chatbots that are available. Now, the easiest is what we call a closed domain, retrieval-based, rule-based chatbot. Um, so what we mean by closed domain is that there is a set number of responses. We've thought about all the questions that the, student, that the student might ask, and we've developed a response to each of those questions. Now, it's not then open domain. So if a student asks a question that we haven't thought about, then the AI chatbot will not have a response to that, or it will have a generic, I don't know how to answer that response. Um, so with a retrieval-based, rule-based um, chatbot system, we can't respond to every possible question that students ask. Um, there's just too many possibilities. So then we have what are called generative-based um, systems. This is the machine learning systems. Now, these generate a response based upon the information provided. Um, and it can draw upon things such as Wikipedia or online encyclopedias, and it can draw upon a whole lot of other previous responses that have been um, done by students and it develops a response based upon a whole lot of information but it's not one set response and it also tends to then have uh, probabilities associated with those so it might say uh, we're 70 percent sure that this is the right response but there's a 30 percent chance it might be this other response and it will randomize that and 70 percent of the time it'll give the most likely response but sometimes it'll give another response, and there might be a hundred other responses. So you can never be sure exactly what response you'll get. But over time, through thousands and thousands of interactions, it will narrow down those uh, probabilities to a set of um, 
responses that have proven to be effective in the past. And that's really um, effective for closed domain systems, such as language translation, where there's a set number of words and things like that, and we can generate that relatively easily and effectively nowadays. It's hard, it takes a fair bit of work, but we've got systems now that do that really well. Making such a generative system, though, that can answer any question, that's what the real potential of AI as we're currently working on, so that you can have an ongoing conversation and it will respond just as would a human would respond and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And we're pretty much there now. Um, not for everything, there's still ways of tricking it and identifying the AI in most cases, although certainly they're, they're working close towards that. But as these systems will be developed, we'll be able to ask any question or have any conversation and it will have a natural feel and provide effective uh, responses during our conversation. And that's the general AI um, model that is being worked on. So for your assignment, of course, we're not asking you to create a general AI. You're going to be creating the rules-based um, closed domain retrieval, um, res retrieval-based responses where you identify a range of possible questions that the student will ask, and then you'll provide set responses to those questions. So chatbots can be used for a range of things, as we've said before. Um, they can imp help improve students' learning. They can collect feedback and data effectively. They can be used to educate students and the response is instantaneous. But there are other benefits. They can be a personalized environment um, tailored to a specific student's needs and interests. Um, they can generally be a comfortable and confident environment. Students can um, ask really dumb questions as they perceive them without fear of reproachment and being embarrassed. Of course, the AI system, unless it's been programmed to, which generally they're not, um, won't make any judgments and um, snarky comments and criticisms of the student. Um, over time, the AI systems will learn how the student thinks, how they phrase things, how they word different questions, and it will adapt to that. Um, they can in, you introduce slang and um, difficult sayings. They can also introduce responses to various languages. Um, as these models develop, AI systems can respond to students in their own home languages. And that can be thousands of languages. Um, and so that provides an advantage over current systems, learning systems, which generally are predominantly in English or in a couple of languages. Um, it's now quite um, well, it's not quite simple yet, but we're moving towards where we'll be able to have AI interactions in any language. And of course, they can be available 24-7. So really complex interactions where students have a, are struggling with a question and struggling to understand an idea and need to talk it through can be done whenever students need to do that. Okay, so the AI system you're going to be developing it will be that closed chat system. And we're going to be using a tool called Bot Libra. Now, Bot Libra is a quite a powerful tool um, and it's an open source environment. Um, and it can be used for making much more generalized hard AI systems. But we're going to use it for, in its simplest formats, to make a closed AI rule-based system. Um, so you're going to be creating this and I've provided you with resources on the course website in terms of instructional guides and videos and so forth to assist you in understanding the Bot Libra um, tool. Um, on the website you'll find an embedded Bot Libra where you can ask questions of it um, and see how it works. Uh, the one I've set up you can also ask questions with your voice um, if you open it up into its, um, you can't do it through the web, uh, to the um, HTML, and you can't through, do, do it through the course website. You have to open the Bod Libra uh, website to do the voice interactions. Um, but then you can talk to it and it will respond. And you can, it, you can also hear its responses. And it also has an avatar. So you can actually get um, facial feedback cues as well. So 
Also on the course website, there's a range of example Bot Libra educational um, chatbots. And you can try those out and explore them and get some ideas for your own educational application. So, again, we'll talk through the processes in the tutorials. Um, hopefully, if you um, engage with the tutorials and explore your ideas about the educational application you wish to create. But you do need to um, have your chatbot teach something. So it's not just having a conversation. It does actually have to be an instructional process whereby the students are learning something through the chatbot conversation. OK, so some of the advantages, as I said, chatbots and AI systems allow us to look at the data in great detail. So you'll be able to look at the conversation logs. So you can have your friends try out conversing with your chatbot and you can have conversations with your chatbot and you can see which interactions, which questions provided a, a good response and which provided a generic or an incorrect response. And then you can adjust your chatbot um, based upon the data that you're seeing there. Um, and that's how we train our chatbot. You can also in, include greetings and different ways it can sort of interact in a um, sort of conversational way with your students and also have default responses. So where it can't give a valid response, what can it say in a more generic way that then prompts students to continue with the conversation and explore things in a way that the chatbot can respond effectively. And again, you can look at all the phrases that you've um, incorporated and the words that trigger responses. So look at Bot Libra, look at the tutorials and instructional guides that teach you how to create it. Um, you don't have to create a very complex chatbot, um, but you do need to think about how it's going to teach students something through that interaction. So think about how you might have taught someone through a conversation or through explaining something to them and how an AI system, in this case a chatbot, could do a similar process. Okay, so the chatbots that you're going to be creating are rule-based. So there are set rules, um, there are set keywords that will trigger set responses. Um, and next week, we're going to look at non-rule-based systems um, that go through deep learning and use what we call neural networks, which is how we have our brain wired up with various neurons between uh, synapses and so forth, um, and how that these systems can develop responses on their own. But that's it for this week. Um, there's some readings to do and the uh, Bot Libra application to explore and to try creating your own small chatbot just to get started or at least have a look at a range of existing chatbots so that you can start getting an understanding of what might be achievable when you create your own chatbot in response to your own portfolio assessment task. That's it for this week. I look forward to seeing you in the tutorials.